Okay, so uh, if I could please welcome uh, Pramod, who will be presenting to us security in the 5G environment. Hey, yep, thank, thank you very much, Chia. Thank you very much. So first of all, thank you very much, Chia. This man has been planning all this SP Summit and Tosi and Sulin and all the folks. And this is the only country, I mean, only area in the entire Cisco Life places in US and Europe and in Australian region. There's one place where a person really and a team really takes an effort to make sure that the service providers are catered for. So thank you very much, and the team. That's a brilliant job, all right? So right, my name is Pramod, Pramod Nair. I'm based right in the middle of nowhere. Uh, I live in Ireland, Dublin, and I've got a pretty weird accent. So if you don't understand what I'm trying to say, please punch me or throw a b bottle at me, and I'll cool down. And I was just joking. Don't come and punch me. It's just a joke. Uh, so the topic we're going to have today is about security. Okay, And I know that the, it's going towards the end of the day, and you might be a bit tired. I'll try to make it as exciting for you as possible. Security is naturally not an exciting subject, but we'll make it as entertaining and as, as uh, interactive as possible. Coming to the interactive part, Please ask as many questions as you want. There is nothing called as a stupid question. There is only something called as a stupid answer. So please feel free to ask as many queries as you want. We, we want to keep this as interactive as possible. Things which you're going to speak today is not an entire end-to-end -end thing, right? Um, I mean, there's a lot of things to speak about. So if you're interested in any specific areas, please reach out to Chia and the team, and we'll make sure that we have got some deeper dives going forward, okay? So let's go ahead and see what we have for this session today. Uh, the actual session today would cater for what is the security enhancements coming out, uh, which has come up in 5G as per the ITC specifications. What are the threat surfaces there? Um, still, once you have those enhancements on ITC, they say three specifications. What are the threat surfaces? How do we mitigate them? Uh, we are not going to speak more about products. We are going to speak about what are the functions or features you would need to mitigate those threat surfaces, okay? So before even going there, let's go ahead and see what we're going to speak about. We saw people like Colin Bradley this morning, uh, Sanjay Call. We saw people like uh, Mike and Sumit Arora and, uh, uh, and Andrew and Shantanu speaking about different parts of these architectures. So when you start speaking about 5G, it's not only about securing the packet core or securing the UEs. You need to have inherent security built into the products as well. You need to have features on top of those products as well. So the topic today is purely on securing your infrastructure. We are not going to speak about the IT part and things like those. We are going to focus on the mobile architecture and see how to secure those parts of architecture. Okay? So this slide is where we are working with a couple of service providers around the world. Uh, and uh, the most recent one last week, we signed agreements with Telenor Group which has got operations in Asia, Pacific regions as well, as well as Europe. We have also signed agreements with Orange, which is one of the biggest service providers in uh, Europe. Uh, and the EMER actually, they have got operations in Africa as well. So we have been working very closely with the service providers to build up their security posture from the existing 4G going towards 5G. Okay, so these are, and I'll speak about some of those use cases today. I've got just 45 minutes, so can't be spending too much time on use cases. As I told earlier on, if you're interested in specific cases, we are open to come and speak about that, okay? So let's see what has HC specified as per its standards and what has been going on, okay? When we speak about the technology going from 2G to 3G, 3G to 4G, and 4G to 5G, the thing which has been improving is the air interface security or encryption mechanisms. Let's speak about 2G. In 2G, you had got the A3, A2, A1, A0 null encryption options. When we speak about 3G, you had got the Snow 3G. And when you speak about the 4G, you got the Snow 4G. The air interface is becoming stronger and stronger. In 5G, we have got the 5G AKA model. The 5G AKA model has got abilities to have non-SIM or non-eSIM kind of uh, devices to be connecting to the infrastructure as well, or at least requesting for access as well. So there are some options built into the air interface. From the subscriber part, in 4G, the initial first request message was unencrypted. It was a clear text. And once the attach is accepted, then the message are encrypted. 
in 5G, the first message as well is going to be encrypted. So the user is much more secure going forward in 5G. The third one is the granularity of functions. So why is that important in the security area? So when we speak about 4G, we had specific network elements like packet gateway, P gateway, which had got the which has got control plane and user planes as well. In 5G, all those elements are segregated and they are separate small functions doing specific action points only. So now it becomes very easy for you to understand where should the control plane functions be secured going forward. Okay? And there are some inbuilt mechanisms as well. For example, the NRF has got a key agreement with all these network functions as well. So the NRF knows that this specific core component is now going to talk to me, so on and so forth. The next one is a roaming interface. Today when we speak about roaming, we are speaking about GRX, we are speaking about diameter, we are speaking about SS7, so on and so forth. They have got inherent uh, vulnerabilities as well. And to secure those vulnerabilities, you have to use things like a diameter inspection uh, and firewalls based on the control plane. Okay? But for 5G, the roaming is based on the SEP, the security protection proxy function which secures or supposed to secure the roaming interface for you going forward. We don't know the actual implications of, of it, whether it's really going to do its job, like the diameter was supposed to do its job, but did not. And we'll see whether the SEP actually caters for it or no. It's too early days because we still don't have a roaming pattern with 5G and 5G, and we don't know whether it'll really work or not. But as per the specifications, that is what is being bought today. Okay? Now let's see, after understanding all these security enhancements, we have gone ahead and spoken to different service providers. Okay? We have been going to different service providers around the world and trying to understand from them, once you have all these specifications, what are the security gaps that we have. Okay? And you will see that, let's take the first case. Okay? Let's take the case of IoT. Why is IoT so important in 5G? It can work in 4G as well, 3G as well, Wi-Fi as well. Why 5G? Because of the very nature of the air interface mechanism. Previously, if, if a device needs to connect to a 4G infrastructure or a 3G infrastructure, it needed a SIM card or a U-SIM card. Without the MC, you can't even have a unique identification. You cannot page, you cannot do various mechanisms, paging mechanisms. It's not possible. In 5G, the AKA model, the authentication and key agreement model on the air interface now allows each and every device supporting the frequency band to sniff the frequency and at least send a request just like we do in Wi-Fi. Which means that each and every IoT device which can now listen or has the chipset to listen to the frequency band of 5G any frequency band, 60 gigahertz, one, one person from uh, Indonesia was speaking about millimeter wave. We don't know the foliage losses even in millimeter wave. You open and close a garage door, the RF uh, coverage will vary. So that is a different story. But the point here is that IoT devices now have access towards your network going forward. And they're going to consume those IoT devices because those devices can be something which you have sold to your customers. So now you have to cater for those weak IoT, uh, IoT devices which are 1 euro, 2 euro or 1 Australian dollars, two, uh, I, I live in Ireland so I'm speaking euros, 1 Australian dollars to 2, two Australian dollars and whether those have got the RSA chipset or have the basic mechanisms to secure themselves. To be honest, it's not there. One of my service providers make 930 million per year revenue purely on IoT. Just imagine how it's going to grow in 5G. So when you have so many plethora of devices, now you need to secure those devices. We'll speak about those use cases as well. Okay? Next is virtualization. Virtualization came up in 1960. Sorry, go ahead, please, go ahead. Uh, so IoT devices, yeah. usually they don't have too much memory, they don't have too much of resources. Yeah. Right, how do so they connect? That, uh, we can't have very good security. Uh, Inbuilt into it, correct, yeah. correct. Right, so there are two ways, right? So one is an IoT device, and I'll just repeat the question, okay? The question from my friend, what's your name, sorry? Kayo. Kayo from? Uh, Brazil. Oh, I love, I, I love um, the fungo de chao, the, the meat. Oh, 
the oh. meat plate. I love it. Yeah. Uh, pickle, yeah, thanks. So what, what we have, the, what my question from my Brazil, Brazilian friend is that, okay, now you have got these IoT devices, which doesn't have inbuilt inherent security because it's as light as possible. How will you secure it, 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 it in 5G? IoT devices can split into two, two kind of large uh, notions of IoT. One IoT, IoT device, which has got a basic IP stack. Okay, it can have some kind of a mechanism to talk to a DNS server and things like those. Other is a basic stack which doesn't even have an IP stack. That will cater for the NAS messaging. So the first messaging of the 5G is now secured or encrypted. So the first layer now is secured for the IoT, but that doesn't secure the full IoT ecosystem. I've got a slide specific on the IoT. I'll make sure I point that to you once I reach there, okay? Does that answer your question so far? Lovely. So let's speak about virtualization, okay? Virtualization came up in 1960s thanks to IBM. I was not even in my liquid form, okay? We are standing in 2019 and now we have slowly started virtualization. Now we speak about containers. Containers is five years old. Docker is five years old. And now we imagine that this Docker has got all these inbuilt security mechanisms. No. The, the reason we are speaking about virtualization is not only because of containers or virtualization, it's an ecosystem. For example, today in 4G and 3G, we have got specific systems. We've got business objects for uh, for, uh, for 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 the Ericsson, iManager for Huawei, NetManager for Nokia, things and so on and so forth. When we speak about virtualization, we are speaking about things like Ansible, we think Puppet. These are all programming languages or methods to, 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 to control these virtualized layers. We are speaking about VMware, we are speaking about Red Hat Linux. It's a different ecosystem. All these ecosystems bring along with it different kinds of threat surfaces and threat actors. Some of them can be catered by best practices, but many of them cannot. We'll speak about those use cases, okay? Distributed architectures. We had our friend Antanu and Andrew speaking about how CUPS, the control plane, user plane is important and how you're going to split all those different user plane functions all over your country in different data centers. The biggest point now is that today you have got one or two GI, SGI interfaces. Going forward, because of this user plane distribution, you're going to have hundreds of or thousands of GI, SGI type interfaces called as the N6 interface. You will say, ah, promote, today I've got one firewall, tomorrow I'll have thousand firewall. It doesn't work that way. You need to cater for latency, you need to cater for various use cases. Threat surface is just growing, guys. Okay? And if you want to make your money, become a cyber security engineer, honest to God. Okay? The last one is new and legacy technologies. Okay. Today you have got 3G and 4G. Operators have invested millions and billions in building their infrastructure. Now they're going towards 5G, which actually needs a, a disruption in the way they are building their architectures. Now we need to make sure that the, that, that the threats in 3G and 4G should not be migrated towards 5G. There is still going to be interaction between the 3G and the 4G, including for the cell selection, reselection, handovers, so on and so forth. We have some use cases on how to cater for those threats and we'll speak about them, okay? Any queries at this point of the time, folks? You're loving it? Brilliant. Let's, let's go ahead. So this is one slide which all my CTOs and CSOs absolutely dig it, okay? In one slide, they have the entire end-to-end -end threat surfaces and now you can take this out and give it to separate team members. For example, if if you're an RF planning and optimization team member, you would much be worried about this areas. If you're a guy who is into a packet core and trying to uh, do the strategy for packet core, you would cater for these areas. If you're a person who is more into the backhauling and things like those, you would cater for these areas. Okay? Now we're speaking about different threat surfaces here, and I can point a few of the threat surfaces which are important, but the one which we cannot speak quite openly about is the LI. L is a lawful intercept. And I cannot speak much about it because once I did, and my manager gave a slap on my wrist, I'm not supposed to speak about that much in the public domain. Now, the real story of LI on a very high level, previously you had got one or two interfaces towards LI, and there was a managed layer on how you could actually request a warrant on some of the interfaces. When you have all these distributed user plane functions, the warrant itself could be a bot. Just imagine having your, your cool number of platinum people who give you good amount of revenue per month and now they are being hacked or they are being snooped upon. It's chaotic. 
Okay, so I can't go much deeper there. But the point here is that once we have these kind of architectures, and this architecture is actually a hybrid architecture. We spoke about the Mac, you have got all these slices, you've got the C or D you split, you've got the small cells. It's a hybrid architecture on which you can superimpose your own architectures as well. So we will speak about some of these use cases, but the point of the slide, the key takeaway of the slide is that the thread surface has got just doubled or tripled when we speak about 5G. Okay? And we, we, we have to cater for 5G. It's not just having an extra layer. There should be a discussion when you build up an architecture for your infrastructure. You can't think, I'll build up my infrastructure and build a layer on top of that. Life doesn't work that way. It will break your information flow. So you need to cater for security or, sec or the logic of security when you build your architecture. Don't put it now. Put it when you make your network live, but at least make sure that you have got some space or the, the fundamental should include the security implications as well. I'm so glad nobody's sitting over here because they're going to be wet. I'm going to, oh. <laughs> okay, so let's, so let's see what happens now. Okay, so let's see the foundation of trust. Okay, the foundation of trust is wherein we have all, all got these inbuilt security mechanisms on our products. Okay, an example is a trust anchor. And this link over here will take you to our entire uh, layers of how we are building it, okay? But before going to the products, the takeaway from this slide is that when you plan for 5G architecture, here we are speaking about smart city systems, how we are going to have different use cases. It's not only about a layer of security, you need inbuilt security mechanisms. And not only the, so the vendors giving you documents or slides showing, you, hey, look, we do this, there should be a way to verify those as well. How do we do it? So we have got a micro loader within our hardware chipsets. That micro loader checks the boot loader. That boot loader checks the OS. So the very idea of security is, that, is anchored on the hardware itself. And if you need to check it, if you have DNSE, have you heard about DNSE? Yeah, it's a, it's a kind of an uh, building up the intent-based networking and things things like those. But the very idea here is that you can have a visibility on the trust of the system if you use DNSC. If you use Cisco Crossworks, which my friend uh, Sumit Arora and uh, Mike was speaking about this morning or this afternoon, there is Crossworks in which you can verify the trust of the iOS XR platforms. So it's not only enough for us to give you slides or documents and hey, look at we do the school things. You need to be able to verify those as well, right? And that is what we pro provide you in our ecosystem. Okay. So and this link will take you. This link or that link over there will take you uh, to the entire product portfolio of Cisco, which support trust anchor and inbuilt security mechanisms as well. So the takeaway again, when you build your 5G architecture, it's not only enough to have security layers. You need to have inbuilt security mechanisms in all the switches, routers, or whatever you're going to put in different places. Okay? Any queries at this point of time, guys? No, good. So let's speak about the first layer. So when we go and speak about 5G architecture and things like those, the first question nowadays of service providers or my customers purely is, okay, Pramod, thank you for all this, but I'm going to deploy my 5G in six, seven months' time. I need the phase one security for me. It's not about architecture, but I want to secure my infrastructure when people come and start deploying their infrastructures. What do I mean by that? When we speak about 5G, it's all about NFVI and virtual functions and things like those and multi-vendor. So you might have a multi-vendor NFVI, Cisco, HP, Dell, Wopsham, Timbuktu, all the different vendors. And then you've got the network function vendors, Cisco, Ericsson, Huawei, Nokia, all these different vendors Okay, on top of it. And then you have got Contractors, you have got subcontractors, you have got people, employees trying to do the configuration of different things. How do you make sure that, that specific vendors are allowed access only to specific vendors? So you have got a vendor ecosystem. Here you see that the this colors are vendor one, vendor two, vendor three, and VNF, just a high level view on what it, what it is all about. Now you need to provide some basic security when people have access only to specific systems. How do you do that? Okay, and what can you do? You call me and we'll make the money. 
Okay, that is what we do. But then what we can really actually do also is, is, is something called as zero trust. Zero trust, if I want to explain zero trust, it is how my wife behaves with me. No trust at all. She verifies and re-verifies. Why don't you make a video call? Because I cannot. I don't want to make a video call. The point here is that zero trust becomes really very important. The idea of zero trust is to verify and re-verify, allow specific vendors for specific servers and specific VNFs only for a specific point of time. It's not only like a VPN where you have a, a, the authentication and the encryption for a server or a VNF. It is also allowing them to make sure that is promote is promote, not, not Chia or somebody else trying to access using my username and password. But now you have to make sure it's promote and promote is from this vendor accessing this NFVI, this VNF for a specific amount of time. That is how it works. And how do we do it? So the first layer is how we call as any kind of VPN. VPN is not going anywhere. So you will still have VPN. I'm sure many of you or all of you are still providing VPN access towards your contractors or vendors. Okay, That will still remain. Now, how do you make sure that it is actually that specific vendor or an employee of that vendor trying to access your system? Here is where we bring in something called as Duo. Have you heard about Duo? Good. So Duo is a company which we bought for $2.3 billion. Cisco has got loads of money. It doesn't mean that the employees have loads of money. The Cisco has loads of money, okay? And $2.3 billion was invested in a cool company called as Duo. Okay. What Duo does, it does multi-factor authentication as well as in the future, it takes out the need for VPN. What do I mean by that? VPN has got two things, encryption and authentication, okay? Going forward, all these applications, containers, and all these cloud-based applications will have encryption built into it. There is no need for a separate layer of encryption. You just need multiple factors of authentication, which is clientless. That is where Duo comes in. So we use Duo over there to make sure that a multi-factor authentication is made sure. For example, I use VPN. For the next step is that it's Pramod who's going to access it. So the request will come to my phone, say, hey, are you trying to access? I say yes, and then I'm allowed access. Now, I'm allowed access, but where am I allowed access? Now, that is given by ICE. Have you heard about ICE? Lovely, you made my life easy. So ICE is basically a segmentation layer. It can work very closely with the Cisco Trust concept, where you can put security group tags and allow access only to specific areas of the infrastructure. Now that job is done. Then, now you need a visibility on that layer and also make sure that if any of these unauthenticated layers or pe people who are not supposed to access a layer get in, they need to be put into a quarantine layer. That is done by the integration between Stealth Watch and ICE. Have you heard about Stealth Watch, guys? Lovely. I'll come to Stealth Watch again and, and I'll speak about Stealth Watch. So that is how we provide a zero trust security. So here is a solution. The previous slide had a problem and here is a solution what to use and how to cater for this use case. Okay. Now let's see how to cater for the RAN and the MEC components. Okay. So here uh, today for example you might have an existing 4G infrastructure and you have built a security gateway. Now, this is one of the slides which is actually going to be deployed in one of our customers. It's actually a strategy slide and which was taken from that strategy slide to make sure that we spread the knowledge in this part of the world as well. So, we have got the 4G infrastructure. The 4G has got the S1, X2 interface, which is an unsecured interface. For that, you've got a security gateway over here and we have got something called as a ASA platform which caters for the IPsec as well, okay? Now let's say you have got 4G and from 4G you are trying to move to the next level which is the CUPS. So what do you need to secure? You will see it over there now. You need to secure the S1, X2 and the XX inter SX interface. SX interface is the interface between the MEC component, the user plane on the MEC co component and the control plane on the centralized layer. And the reason you need to secure that SX interface is because that interface does not have inbuilt security. It doesn't have an authentication layer. It doesn't have an encryption layer. So how you can build your infrastructure is by still using the same security gateway over here, but then you put on virtualized small security gateways at the edge compute layer. That is a layer. 
Then the next one from there is going to the NSA model. And when you go to the NSA model, you've got new interfaces, N2, N3, N4, N6 interfaces, which you need to secure. And the same goes for the SA model as well. The takeaway from this slide is that as the air interface encryption and security has increased, the interface security is becoming weaker and weaker. It was first seen in 4G when we had the S1, X2 interface unsecured. Now in 5G, we have all this XX, XN, N2, N3, N4 interfaces without security guys. Okay, so the reason these are being made is to allow multiple vendors and virtual network operators to build up their infrastructure as soon as possible. And they secure the users just by giving that air interface encryption, but their infrastructure is becoming weaker and weaker. This is a big differentiator in 5G. They allow you to build up all these use cases, the standards specify many use cases, you can do all those use cases, it's flexible, it's virtualized, cloud native architecture, you can deploy on the cloud, but the fundamentals of your network being hacked becomes open and easier and easier. I have not even reached the API stage, okay? My daughter is 10 years old and she makes her own programs. API, she can look into YouTube, for example, in one hour, she can understand APIs. Just imagine a person who is a cool hacker, he or she can break into your API structure anytime he or she wants. And he can do nothing about it, okay? And we need to secure those kind of interfaces, right? And we'll speak about those use cases. Any queries at this point of the time, guys? So Jeff, I'm doing a very good job, it seems. So now let's go to the 4G, 5G code uh, workloads and interfaces. So we had previous uh, person speaking, uh, speaking about network-based edge compute. Okay, here is the edge compute, which is not on the premises of the enterprise. It's purely on the on the network layer for virtual BBUs, applications, gaming, and those kind of things. Okay, now when we have these layers, you still have your existing 4G infrastructure. If you see this layer over here, diameter GTP SS7, the same over here, you will see that there are existing layers which needs to be secured as well. Why? Because these are the exact vulnerabilities on these layers. Okay, so that is not going anywhere at all. And once we speak about new use cases, the premise based use cases, you have got more threat surfaces. My point here is that once you have this exposure towards enterprises and things like those, you need to cater for the identity and the access management as well. It's called IAM systems, okay? Now, how do you do it? So the first thing you will do it is by making sure that you have got specific layers of security on those part of the infrastructure. One of them is called the WAF, the Web Application Firewall. This is what is going to secure your API is going forward. You might have inbuilt security mechanisms on a packet core of a, uh, of a vendor. For example, Cisco has got all these inbuilt uh, open tray systems and things like those on the packet core, but I'm not sure about other vendors as well, right? But the point here is that you have got these new interfaces which need security going forward. I've already explained the zero trust policy over here, which is using Duo, ICE, and StealthWatch, and we'll cater for those over here as well. Okay, that is how you're going to secure your infrastructure going forward. And the stealth watch, I'll come to it in a second. And this is the actual way how you would configure your eyes with the ACI to make sure the policy is seamless from your on-premise mech towards your centralized data centers. Okay, this is the actual how we are doing it. And this is a part of the CVD, Cisco validated design if you're going to deploy the edge architecture. Okay. So now let's speak about virtualization, and this is one of my most favorite topic, and this is where I'm going to use um, the whiteboard. Let's speak about the use case of your existing packet core folks, or existing data centers, okay? Let's take an example of an interface which is one gigabit per second, okay? That is equal to one into 10 raised to nine bits per second. I'm sorry for my handwriting, this is how I passed my thesis. My professor had no, no clue what I'm writing and was promo, boom, 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 I, I got passed, okay? <laughs> this is what is the interface is all about. Let's take a packet size in your infrastructure which could be 450 bytes. So 450 multiplied by eight will give you 3,600 bits per second, okay? 
let's say the packets per second. So now if, if you need to calculate packets per second, you divide this by this. You will get 278,000 packets per second. I did the calculation before coming over here. I'm not a genius, okay? I did this before. So we have got 278,000 packets per second if your interface is one gig, guys, okay? Let's imagine your, your interface is 10 gigs. You have got 2.7 million packets per second flowing through you. 2.78. And out of the, those, 70 to 80% is going to be encrypted. Now, out of those 2.78 million packets per second, you have to find out what are the malicious packets which are encrypted. You cannot do it, guys. You cannot even use the method of decrypting the packet, understanding the malicious packets, encrypting it back and setting the flow. You cannot do it. Those days are gone, guys. Really, you cannot have those kind of methods or implementations on 4G, guys. Oh, uh, 5G, sorry. You're going to increase the latency going forward. How do we do it? What is the best way to do it? We are speaking here about machine learning. Not the machine learning of the marketing, guys, the real machine learning. Okay, there's a lot of algorithms in different ways. So how we do it? First of all, we collect the packets from the infrastructure. We collect the, the flows, the packets from your network devices, from your switches, routers, so on and so forth. We use the metadata from the hypervisors. And then we put Istio on your container cluster and pull the metadata of the containers from Istio. So now we have the flows of the network, we have got the flows of your virtualized layer, now we have got the flows of your containers as well. Is that enough to detect the different threats? That's not enough. So what then we do, we use machine learning. What I mean by machine learning? It's a method how we understand whether a, we don't decrypt the packet, we just take the header information. From the header information, we understand things like what is the TLS version, who has given the certificate, when was it signed, what is the SPLT, space length times. Okay? For example, if the payload is a video, there's a specific space length times defined on the header as well. We take all these values and we also use the values, right? If we give you four kinds of different TLS certificates, what kind of certificates is the, is the server being uh, choosing? And for how many num number of times? We use all those information and then we come to a conclusion that the packet, that the payload is malicious or no. This is cool, isn't it? We are not decrypting the packet and without decrypting the packet, we are finding out the malicious packet within the whole payload system, right? Now, this is very important. That is how we do it. Okay. Now, I'll attach that to the, this, this virtualization part, okay? Let's say you have got a NFVI system or a NFVI pod which has got a side channel at a kind of theory. What is that? You've got two VNFs and they're using the same memory line of the memory cache of the CPU. So if VNF1, and there's a method using PLL, phase log loop and things like those, phase log loop is a method wherein, for example, you're using cruise control on, on your car and a car is going more than 100 and a cruise control is at 100, a negative loop is applied to reduce the speed. And if your car is going slow, it will apply a positive loop to increase the speed. This method is used in electronics, using MATLAB you can figure out that, what is the noise figure of the system for a specific OS level. And with that, the second BNF, which is using the same memory line cache, can now understand what kind of OS is being used on VNF1. Right? Now, if VNF1 can sniff what is going on with VNF2, or if VNF2 can sniff what is going on in VNF1, is that a problem? Is that a problem? For example, if I tell you my secret and you tell me my secret, is that a problem? The real problem is when you tell that to my wife and she slaps the shit out of my pants. That is a problem, right? The same way, same way on VNFs, two VNFs sniffing each other is not a problem. The real problem is when I pass that information outside the infrastructure, maybe to a command and control center, that is a problem. And the solution we found out to that, where is my, yeah. The solution I found out to that was to use the stealth watch 
to use all those machine learning and things like those and come up with something called a suspect quite long flow. That's a counter within the stealth watch system which will tell you whether some information is going outside your infrastructure or no. This is a very good use case and many of my customers are planning to use it, are testing it on their packet core today as we speak okay? and we see this deployments very soon there. So the next layer for me is the slicing layer. So we all have spoken about slicing and, and this is a separate slice. All these are different slices. For some reason, this slice is not coming up in a different color. Maybe I did not copy paste it properly, I don't know. Yeah, so let's see what is the problem on the slice. Okay, This is slice one, slice two, and slice three over there. And you might have sl the slices like V2X, which might use multiple slices for the same device. The concept of slice is not one device per slice. It's just that a specific function is allowed for that device. And that device can have multiple slices as well. Okay? Let's see, you have got a thread surface here. There you can see it over there. Okay? Let's say you have got some kind of a malware or some kind of a bot on the IoT slice. Okay? Thank you very much. From there, you will have... If you don't have proper isolation, the malware spreads out not only to the IoT devices, but also to your slices as well. What does that mean for you? It also means that the, that the data can be exfiltrated. Right? So a malware or a bot on an IoT device hits your packet core, sits there, does a passive threat kind of a thing, which will then spread it, itself out in the entire virtualized layer. And for, for, for understanding and for controlling all these things, you need visibility. That is where Stealth Watch comes in the picture. All these machine learning, all this packet capturing on the container, on a virtualized layer, on a network device layer, using all these machine learning and understanding and giving you the value. This is where the real value of visibility comes in the picture. You never need to have this, have this in 3G or 4G. People give flying doors about all these things in 4G. Come 5G, that is really the biggest threat surface. And you need to have visibility at the end-to-end -end layer. Okay? And we will see and how to do it. We have done a de demo of how to do it. We don't have the time. But if you're interested in these kind of use cases, please reach out to Chia or Tusi or any of your account team members. And we'll make sure that you give you a proper demo, take you through the packet lifecycle, and make sure that you understand the value of these use cases. Maybe you have some system in your infrastructure already. It's not only about selling products. It's about being passionate about what you're doing, right? We are there for you. We want to be a partner with you, not only for, for selling products, but to build architectures, OK? And we can do this for sure today. And I've got some screenshots. So here in a, in a screenshot, you will see that there are different slice policies. And there's an alert and an alarm saying that a slice policy has been violated. What is a slice policy? A IoT slice is not supposed to talk to a MBB or a EMBB slice. A EMBB slice is not supposed to be talking to a machine to machine slice. That is what a policy is all about. If that policy is violated, you will see an alert. Now, after the alert, what you see is what systems outside your infrastructure. It's not only China, you see, China is nowhere in the picture. It's United States, France, Netherlands, India, Brazil. And this is just kept in an open system. And China's nowhere in the picture, guys, OK? And we've got all these systems reaching out to the IoT slice. And from the IoT slice, being migrating to your 4G infrastructures as well. You need these visibility, guys, OK? That is what we have done using this demo in a lab. And thank God my wife did not pull the plug of the server, else uh, I could not even show this. I picked this up just yesterday morning. So uh, and these are more values of 4G and things like those. Let's speak about securing the endpoints. And here is where my Brazilian friend will be more interested in. My friend is busy uh, checking his phone, but I'll show you the thing. So you had asked a question. I, I, I'm used to it. Don't worry. So this is the IoT uh, kind of use cases when we have the threat surfaces now. Okay. So your question was, okay, I've got this IoT devices, and how do I do if it has got a weak stack? Okay. The days of just putting firewall to mitigate the threats are slowly coming to an end. We need multiple layers. The first layer of what we would recommend is using something called as a DNS scrubbing agent. 
Cisco has something called as Cisco umbrella, but there are other vendors out there doing things as well. Depends what you use, okay? The first layer should be the DNS scrubbing layer. 90 to 91 percent of the thread surfaces are covered there. Okay. There is no system in this world which will secure your infrastructure 100 percent. I can just help you to snore a bit better at night. Okay. I can't even help you to sleep better at night, just snore better. Okay. The point here is that if you need to secure these kind of infrastructures, the first layer always will be, will be a DNS scrubbing kind of a layer. It will take out 90 to 95 percent of your threat surface directly because everything is based on DNS, right? I need to go to a command and control server. I will not make 100 IP addresses for one. I will make a URL. Behind the URL, I've got multiple NAT, for example, and then I use multiple servers. I'm not going to give each one of them a public uh, IP address. So all these command and control centers can be controlled by giving a better value at the DNS level. And we have umbrella of the shelf today and we can do this off the shelf next second. And we have been doing this for the biggest operator in Europe and it, it's called Telecom Italia and they use this DNS umbrella in their infrastructure now. Okay? The next one is giving you the capability to prevent the DDoS attacks on your infrastructure. Okay, that is one layer. We have got multiple options. We have got the, this uh, option of having, we, we partner with two or three vendors on the DDoS. It's not our own product. We partner with them, but that solution is integrated as in a one box. So we can cater for those as well. The next layer, of course, is visibility and segmentation, which we spoke about. So StealthWatch, again, will cater for the IoT part as well. And when I say stealth watch giving you visibility, I'm not speaking about data plane or user plane. I'm speaking about control plane. Once we have this one terabits per second data coming in 5G, you don't want to be using visibility on the user plane data. Of course, use it, buy it from me, I'll be happy. But the real thing is that control plane is where you need a deeper visibility and a better visibility, okay, when you build your architecture. Um, so yeah, these are multiple layers of which you would need going forward when you build your architecture, you see that there are no products mentioned at all. It's purely features. You need these features in your infrastructure going forward. If you need to map it to Cisco level products, we have given the Cisco products as well. And if you're interested in any of these layers, any of these use cases, please reach out to Chia and team and we can take you through it. So just a short one slider on how what we can help you going forward. We want to be partners with you guys. It's not only about selling products. Of course, we want to sell products. You want the moon, I'll give you the stars for free, but not the moon, okay? So we'll do all these things. We need to work together. But the idea here is that we need to work together as a, to build the ecosystem. We need to have, and, and it's good for you to have a small forum where you talk with the other service providers as well to understand what kind of attacks they might be going through. That's very important for you. The next level is the risk assessment. It's not only about products. Maybe you have many of those functions or features in your system already. It's about understanding those systems and features better and maybe changing the parameter attributes or changing some part of your infrastructure design. We can work with that as well. We have got a Cisco CX team or advanced services team which can help you go through those as well. The deployment risk, that, that is the number one risk which many of my customers are speaking about. Uh, they are speaking about all these layers wherein people start come and start configuring the infrastructure to deploy 5G and we want to work with you and help you through that process. Okay? The next one is visibility and control. The key, key point, key takeaway point if you don't know if the threat exists or not, you cannot control it. You need to see, you need to understand if a threat is present or no, and then you can start mitigating those threats. And we have got Stealth Watch, which is absolutely does that job absolutely well. Okay. With that, guys, thank you very much. And we have got these links. I've got the 5G white paper by me and Mikey is there on this uh, Cisco 5G white paper. Please read through it. We have got a CVD for many of these use cases uh, as well. Thank you very much for your time. But any questions? Chia, sorry. Okay. Thank you very much, Ramad. We, you might have to grab Pramod offline. Uh, he's going to be here for the drinks later today as well, and course, you know, uh, set up with the reception there if you want to have time with him.